So hello everyone and welcome uh, to this uh, seminar session. It's a pleasure, pleasure to see you all here today. Um, and as always, before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to give you the house rules. Please keep your microphones muted during the entire talk. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. Uh, I would also uh, ask you to use either the raise hand function or the chat box in order to make your questions. If you were a Portuguese, French or, or Spanish speaker, uh, please feel free to use your own language while making your question uh, by typing that on the chat. We are happy to translate it into English if necessary. Finally, I would also like to remind you that this session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel later on. And also, I would like to let you know that most of our videos are already online. So if you missed any of our sessions, you can check that on our YouTube channel. Well, uh, having that said, we are very happy to receive Dr. Lorenza Gianfrancesco today. Uh, Lorenza is a senior lecturer in early modern history at the University of Chichester. She holds a laurea in late medieval and early modern literature and history, and a MA in Renaissance or early modern Europe from uh, the Royal Holloway, University of London, and a PhD in early modern Italy, Italian cultural history, uh, also from the Royal Holloway. Her main research interests are communication, propaganda, and dissent in early modern southern Italy, with a focus on Naples. She is the author of a number of works. Among them, I would like to uh, mention her book, Disaster Narratives in Early Modern Naples, Politics, Communication, and Culture, published in 2018. Uh, today, uh, Lorenzo will present a paper entitled Disaster, Propaganda, and Dissent in 17th Century Naples, uh, the 1631 Eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which we are all very excited uh, to hear. Thank you, Lorenzo, for accepting our invitation once again, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank Veronica and Livia for inviting me and for um, having given me the opportunity to be here tonight. And thank you for all of you for finding the time to uh, attend this very brief paper. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully it will be a uh, window. Uh, Right, let me see if I can do it because it doesn't come up. Uh, share. Right, Veronica, I don't seem to be able to do anything because all I can see is the screen. When I want to share my PowerPoint, all I can see is the screen with all of us, with all the participants. Um, oh, that, that's odd. Um... Do you want to, you know, maybe uh, refresh your, your window and join the, the call again? It might work. Let's try now. Oh, yes, it's here. Okay, perfect. Sure. Okay, can you all see it? Uh, it's uh, still loading? Yeah, okay, now it's so working. Well, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, as uh, um, Veronica said, my paper is entitled Disaster, Propaganda, Dissent in 17th Century Naples. And the focus of my paper is going to be the 1631 eruption of Man Vesuvius. So, Naples was hit by a violent earthquake in the middle of the night. My children rose quickly and ran towards the window. We saw a terrifying fire coming out from Mount Vesuvius, which reached the sky in no time. The fire also spread down the mountain towards the sea. The frightening roar of thunder and lightning was worse than that of a firing bobband cannon. So here, in a letter sent from Naples, its author described what he had seen and felt in the city in the dark hours of the 16th of December, 1631. At dawn that day, Mount Vesuvius was responsible for the most catastrophic natural disaster in 17th century European history. Preceded and followed by earthquakes, which left many people destitute and homeless, survivors of the eruption struggled to breathe as their lungs became 
clogged with volcanic ash that also darkened the city sky for nearly two weeks. With an estimated 50,000 casualties, the devastation of cultivated fields, the death of a large amount of livestock, and the destruction of entire villages around Naples, those situated at the slope of the mountain, the 1631 eruption changed Vesuvius' image for the worse. With the exception of the notorious, notorious Plinian account of the eruption that occurred in 79 Common Era, Vesuvius' history had been barely recorded. An occurrence unprecedented in living memory, the mountain's sudden awakening in December 1631 exposed Neapolitans and their Spanish rulers to an unfamiliar type of natural disaster, unlike the earthquakes which regularly shook Naples. As the first of a series of volcanic eruptions that hit Campania, so the region uh, in which Vesuvius is located, throughout the 17th century, the 1631 disaster generated a European-wide interest that ranged from news to politics, from literature to science. That event also occurred in a, in a period during which Naples was the largest city in Europe, with an estimated population of 400,000 people. It, Naples was also the capital of a kingdom under Spanish rule that extended from south of Rome to Sicily, and this territory roughly covered um, half of the Italian peninsula. At that time, Naples was also prime center of learning. It was home to academies, museums, and research centers that promoted intellectual mobility, the circulation of ideas, and an unprecedented expansion of the city's printing industry. But the large amount of material published in Naples on this disaster also positions the 1631 eruption of Vesuvius as a case study to reconstruct the dynamics of mass communication in early modern Mediterranean Europe. Within the Neapolitan public sphere, Vesuvius generated a debate that located disasters within a civic, religious, political and scholarly dimension. Some of the major beneficiaries from the crisis that hit Naples and its vicinities were those in the business of communication, who profited through an unprecedented production of printed sources that circulated both within Naples and indeed throughout Europe. Between 1631, as Vesuvius was erupting, and the eruption lasted for two weeks, and 1635, some 250 works on the 1631 eruption were published in Naples only. This number, however, excludes manuscripts, correspondence, and diplomatic dispatches. So, what can we learn from this <laughs> copious amount of sources? How significant are they in enhancing our understanding of Vesuvius history and its context? So, in my brief paper today, I would like to discuss the role of various sources, both printed and in manuscript form, in generating a narrative of the eruption that was located within a um, political, religious and scholarly dimension. Sources on the 1631 eruption of Vesuvius tell us a great deal about Naples' social fabric, its institutions, not to mention the value of propaganda, censorship and, not least, dissent. Besides, Vesuvius eruptions generated starting from this event, generated an iconographical tradition that, like written sources, it is multidisciplinary in nature and therefore of major historical significance. So, during the dark days of the eruption, a man called Vincenzo Bove, owner of a bookshop in Naples, was busy recording what he witnessed and was witnessing. He notes, uh, where were uh, quickly published as a, an account called Relazione that became one of the mostly widely circulated accounts of the eruption. And you can see uh, a, the frontispiece of uh, uh, Bove's account on your left hand side. Um, the, 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 this uh, account was republished at least 11 times in the space of a year. A bestseller um, 
Bove's brief work was simultaneously issued by three Neapolitan printers. And seeing an opportunity in the market, he secured himself the right to sell his account and his, um, at his own work, bookshop, together with others on Vesuvius, published in the same period. Nonetheless, Bove's short text was hardly the only source available on the market. In the month following the eruption, the Neapolitan publishing industry enjoyed a prosperous moment. Customers, and you can see here just some examples, a, a couple of more uh, examples on these very short texts that were published, as I said, as Vesuvius was erupt erupting and shortly afterwards. Um, these were um, addressed to a, a wider audience and customers ranged from scholars to the uneducated to whom short texts on this event were read within an emergence practice of shared consumption. So in a milieu where academies, artists and single scholars competed for patrons' commissions, printing workshops in the city had tight, tight deadlines to issue material on Vesuvius. And here, this uh, I would like to bring your attention, not just to uh, this type of material, but also to the typographical ornaments that you are seeing on this frontispiece. And why are they relevant? It's because we can see them repeated in various accounts that were published um, from 1631 onwards, because they were published in so, such a great number that there was no time to, <laughs> to create new engravers um, on Vesuvius. So we can see that uh, these uh, um, very um, unsophisticated engravers um, appear on the frontispiece of, uh, of various um, texts of uh, the same kind. So, but from short accounts to lengthy treatises which appeared on the market from uh, spring 1632, material on Vesuvius began circulating also beyond Naples. And uh, here um, is a, a, re a relazione, so an account that was published in 1632 simultaneously in Naples and then Rome and Florence. So the news um, concerned with this event just uh, traveled very fast um, and reached uh, in 1632, reached not just uh, Rome and Florence, like in this case, but also Milan, Genoa and uh, Venice. But some texts were also translated into foreign languages, thus constituted the source for newsletters circulating throughout Europe. And there is a copious amount of newsletters that were circulating in Europe at the time and recording and giving an account of this catastrophic event. But today I just would like to show you uh, an English weekly news book um, published in London in spring 1632, uh, which um, it contains a, a quite a detailed description of uh, uh, the eruption of Vesuvius. As you can see here um, at the bottom of this image, um, it, it, there is a, a specific reference to, uh, to the, that event, a more exact relation of the fearful burning of the hill Soma. Uh, Soma was um, the name that was often used to, uh, to, um, uh, for Vesuvius near Naples. And then the former with the effect it had wrought in the city upon the public harlots as well as other people. So, and here, uh, this is just a, a long passage, which, uh, I mean, struck me when I read it for the first time, because it's quite detailed and it's in, it is mainly based on the, um, the violent earthquakes that hit the city, uh, the rain of ashes that darkened the city for a few days. And also we see here representation of the response, the collective response to uh, what was uh, happening following uh, the eruption of, of Vesuvius. So, as recently um, uh, argued by Sean Coco, uh, these accounts transformed calamity into news, chronicle, and also explanation. What is more, the profitable business generated by the large production of texts on the 1631 disaster constituted an opportunity to temporarily 
resolve long-term friction between Neapolitan printers and the local authorities. The existence of cases concerned with denunciation and petitions against edicts that had granted the archiepiscopal authorities the right to search printing houses and bookshops, as well as issue licenses to print, sheds light on the strict control exercised on the activities of Neapolitan printers. And this is something that uh, we will um, look more closely when analysing some of the contents of uh, this material. So these disputes also highlight the government's concerns about the destabilising impact of new circulation. In light of this, the authorities' aim was to commission accounts on the eruption that were in line with propaganda policies and public expectations. Hence, an agreement between printers and censors secured the censor agreement, the censor's agreement, which always appears in this text, the so-called imprimatur, to a large uh, amount of text which praised the action of the state and the church in providing practical support to civilians whilst acting as intercessors to appease divine anger. So we see here that there is also a cultural dimension attached to the narrative on uh, this event. So as mentioned a few minutes ago, text range from short accounts, we've seen some frontispieces, to works of prose and poetry, as well as academic treatises that appeared in the market, on the market, by spring 1632. And here you have an example of, uh, um, um, of, a, of a treatise um, on Vesuvius, which was commissioned uh, by the state authority uh, authorities. And as you can see, the title page and the engraving that uh, um, accompanies uh, the title page is very uh, is much more sophisticated. They form it, and this is uh, this specific one is in quarto. Uh, also informs us on uh, um, on readership and book circulation. So the earlier sources that appeared on the market were in cheap octavos. So all the relazioni that I've shown were in cheap octavos. So portable material that could be sold, circulated, and also read. Uh, in an accessible language. Conversely, books such as these, um, quartos uh, and uh, commissioned by the authorities, were luxury editions which were accompanied with engravers executed by important uh, artists, recognized artists um, at, the, at the time of operating in, in Naples. And the book, um, Giuliani's book, which is this one, also uh, contains these two beautiful images, beautiful engravings, engravings by uh, Nicolas Perret, which, which describes the position of Vesuvius before the, the eruption and um, after the eruptions. And we can see a detail here that is very important and will come, um, that, which I shall discuss more in depth uh, in a few minutes. A detail on the left hand side, on top left hand side, you can see um, the patron saint of Naples redirecting the fury of Vesuvius uh, towards the sea rather than towards the city. So we can see. Um, that in, uh, the, the, in, the, in the official narrative of the event, the role of religion became central. Um, this book was also dedicated to Count, uh, the Count of Olivares, so it was intended to reach the court in Madrid too. So the central role given in these sources to religious or political leaders, such as the Spanish Viceroy or the city's Cardinal, also informs us about the dynamics of patronage and censorship in early modern Naples. So Vincenzo Bobbi's successful account, for instance, was a eulogy to the city's uh, Cardinal, Francesco Boncompagni. Bobbe portrayed Neapolitan society as acting cohesively through rituals of collective devotion presided over by the Cardinal. Acting as an intercessor to uh, San uh, Yenarius, uh, one of the patron saints of Naples, the one uh, represented in, uh, in this uh, engraving. Um, he was one of the many patron saints of Naples, but nevertheless the most important one. Boncompagni, um, the, so the cardinal, organized a procession that gathered the entire city of Naples, formed of people crying out for forgiveness, prostitutes marching in white sack cloth having cut a hair as a sign of penitence, and children silently holding candles 
the crowd proceeded united from one of the gates, um, or one of the city's gates, the North Gates, Capuana Gate, uh, towards um, the church. Here, um, one of the churches in Naples. Here, the cardinal raised the um, in here a quote from Bove, raised the, the ampoules containing the blood and the relics of San Vienarius towards the mount that was erupting in the direction of Naples, end of quote. So in an act that confronted the violence of natural disasters with the strength of faith, Bon Compagni raised the ampoules towards the erupting mountain, which uh, turned its fury from the city towards the sea. So this public event was later immortalized um, in painting. And here I would like to bring to your attention a marvelous painting by a Neapolitan uh, painter, uh, Domenico Gargiulo, very famous, uh, who uh, actually is famous for having uh, immortalized um, disasters in Naples. Uh, so the eruptions and later on also the plague that hit the city in 1654. This painting was possibly inspired by the type of printed material that I've just briefly discussed, and it is also a testimony to the fluidity between written sources and, um, and the visual arts. So we can see here, so, uh, and i show you with my cursor, you can see here the, um, the, um, the relics, the head and the blood of San Dionarius, which is carried um, on a baldachin, uh, behind which um, features the uh, cardinal and uh, very city uh, officials and the viceroy and uh, various confraternities and the crowd uh, that um, go towards the gate just to show the power of uh, uh, religious relics um, to stop the fury of Vesuvius that is erupting in the background, but which in the end did not turn um, its uh, uh, violence towards the sea. So conversely, um, another account on the eruption, I mentioned Bove, but um, one by um, Giovanni Geronimo Favella um, on the eruption was commissioned not by the religious authorities by, but by the Spanish authorities in Naples. He appointed as writer of gazettes and news by the Spanish Viceroy Manuel uh, de Acevedo y Zuniga, con, Count of Monterrey, uh, Favella centralized in his brief text the role of the Count in saving the city from the violence of Vesuvius. So in some accounts, um, uh, centrality is given to the role of the Cardinal, in others, um, centrality is given to uh, the role of, um, of the Viceroy. So, and this tells us a great deal about the dynamics of uh, patronage and censorship in Naples at the time. So, um, Boven uh, Favella notes that in a brave public appearance, the Count of Monterey, quote, went to church where he, having refused the cushion that had been offered to him, knelt humbly before the Holy Virgin to implore for the salvation of Neapolitans." End of quote. The Viceroy's public appearance in religious rituals conformed to the Spanish conception of kingship, according to which the king and on a small scale um, Viceroy's and the Viceroy in, in Naples was the king's representative um, in, in uh, Italian dominions. So they were the recipient of divine favours. Um, hence, by attending mass, leading processions, and even communicating with divine entities, the viceroy performed a divine function on behalf of the king. So the narrative of these texts also looked at disasters as being generated by human misconduct, unsurprisingly so, uh, through an emotional narrative intended to appeal to the reader's conscience Words offered a vision of devastated land with carcasses and scalded corpses left unburied. Accounts of the city's authorities ordering that, and here I quote, dead animals be buried to preserve the air from being infected, and the quote, made the reader imagine the smell of contaminated air. Narrations of collective hysterias and cathartic religious rituals made the reader hear the voices of sufferers imploring God for forgiveness. Similarly, descriptions of uh, 
quote, a burnt spongy substance, end of quote, that was identified as human flesh made the reader visualize images of death and decomposition. Here, the idea of catastrophe was also accentuated by descriptions of refugees entering the city of Naples. And here we have a, an image by a, uh, a, a Dutch um, artist representing um, the um, people, um, a number of people uh, crossing the bridge coming from the villages that had been destroyed by Vesuvius, crossing the bridge and trying, uh, and trying to enter the city um, of Naples. So we have mothers dragging their terrified children, men carrying on their shoulders their poor belongings, and wounded people begging for help, where are current tropes in text on the 1631 eruption. But we also have, and this is very interesting because the dialogue between the visual and the written world, it's, it's, um, it makes historical analysis even more interesting. And so we can, on the one hand, we can uh, read descriptions of this kind of civilians, desperate civilians entering the city. And on the other, we can see in uh, these represented in, in, uh, the, in the visual arts, um, broadly speaking. So such accounts also reported on the disastrous situation of villages situated around Vesuvius. In a journey to some of the destroyed villages, the Venetian ambassador in Na uh, to Naples, Marco Antonio Padavino, had a taste of what the fury of Vesuvius had left behind. Upon arriving uh, in, uh, in one of the villages, uh, Torre del Greco, which uh, is located at the foot of the mountain and very, very close to Herculaneum, he reported that, and here I quote, in this place, I saw an uncomprehensible jungle, jumble of human corpses ripped open in many pieces and of many animals laid between trees, doors, windows, benches, mattresses, clothes, stools, chairs, chests, barrels, and rubble. Not to mention many other things partly buried by the ash. Much more may be said about that horrible spectacle, but it is impossible to express it sufficiently. I found myself greatly confused, for such things were a true portrait of chaos." End of quote. The realistic tone employed in printed texts to describe the scale of the 1631 eruption was also set within a context that looked at the violence of Vesuvius from a religious angle seen as manifestations of a godly design to punish spiritual corruption, cataclysms impelled people to repent their sins. Descriptions of collective rituals of religious penitence, self-adulations, which I've briefly discussed uh, a few minutes ago, and also acting of co collective praying, united the population in regaining uh, divine benevolence. These descriptions were paired by interpretation of the disaster as a prophetic sign. So vision of, quote, sudden darkness, rain, rains of ashes and thunders that resembled the uh, rumble of artillery made people believe that the end of the world was coming, end of quote. Preachers sermonizing the day of the judgment also provided an apocalyptic scenario for which everyone was preparing. The explosions of Vesuvius because this, erupt, uh, this eruption was a subplenian um, of a sub, sub, subplenian typology, so very violent and explosive, um, were described as infernal rows. The tongues of fire and the earthquakes that destroyed lands and villages resembled description of a coming end of history. The belief that the eruption had been preceded by premonitory signs was also interpreted as a warning of a far greater, greater imminent misfortune sent by God to humans. Interestingly, this frame of mind conformed to the general picture of European Christian millenarianism, both Catholic and Protestant. And, the, and I find this very interesting because I deal obviously in my research with mainly Prote uh, Catholic sources, but seeing that there was, there were so many similarities within the Protestant world, um, it's uh, a, an aspect of uh, um, the, re 
of a surviving religious unity um, that I find very, very interesting to analyze. So as be, as be noted uh, of early modern England, and here I quote, portents could be natural phenomena such as earthquakes, storms and the like, or apparitions in the, in the heavens like new stars, comets and eclipses, end of quote. And this is very true. In a letter sent from Naples to Nicolas Claude Fabri du Peresque, its author, a Cartusian friar named uh, San uh, Don uh, Severo in Naples mentioned several pre pre premonitory signs uh, that had been observed shortly before the eruption. In October 1631, for instance, a cold wind hit Naples, causing an unusual climatic change and a sudden drop in temperature. <clears throat> a month later, the friar reported in his letter, a comet was seen around Vesuvius. Those signs were interpreted as part of a broader succession of calamitous events as, and here I quote, at the end of this year, the whole of the Italian peninsula would be hit by calamitous event, namely wars, plague in, uh, and plague in the same way as the kingdom, our kingdom has been hit by the eruption of Vesuvius, end of quote. So comets, stars, earthquakes or eclipses were officially seen as judgment on a general corruption of manners, which could only be stopped through expiation. It was in this context that Vesuvius became a subject of religious literature. Texts of prayers, for instance, constitute a valuable source to understand issues related to collective devotion, anxiety, fear, but also expectations. Moreover, during the eruption, religious broadsides circulated in churches and private houses. So in a flyer, flyer called, um, and you can see um, the flyer here, it's very rare, I've been able to identify it in one place in Europe. Um, this flyer, which is called the most devout remedy against earthquakes, lightning and uh, uh, thunders. Um, in this um, very sh short um, text, the Neapolitans were advised to display a particular prayer on their doors, um, but also on their windows and walls. So in this 14 line prayer, the voice of God assures people not to fear but to have faith in his protection. So at the end of a two week a long two week eruption, which also witnessed earthquakes and a tidal wave that caused a monumental disaster, Naples was spared from destruction, although um, the city had been hit by uh, violent earthquakes. Unsurprisingly, many interpreted this as a manifestation of God's benevolence towards Neapolitans, which in turn cemented the idea of Naples as a chosen city. And this idea was also, um, uh, was also expressed through a major commission that all the guilds of Naples uh, made to Cosimo Fanzago, an important artist, um, in 1636, uh, 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 um, where his uh, uh, obelisk uh, of San Gennaro, San Gennarius, was uh, um, displayed in one of the major um, piazze squares in the city um, as a sign, as a, um, a way to honouring, um, to honour the uh, protection that uh, San Gennarius had granted uh, to the city of Naples and its citizens do, uh, during uh, the eruption of Vesuvius. So, as we've seen, through a narrative that stressed the role of state or religious authorities in supporting Neapolitans during the 1631 crisis, texts on the eruption also fulfilled the task of shaping an image of Naples as a model for solid government and social stability, as well as articulating civic and religious pride. The examples I have shown here also inform us about the power of censorship, deliberately obscured in printed sources, instances concerned with dissent and discontent 
mainly appeared and still are still this, um, still survive in manuscript. And we're talking, um, and here I'm referring to private correspondence, diaries, academic speeches, and diplomatic dispatches. Moreover, dissent often disseminated um, through anonymous compositions written in Neapolitan and publicly affixed in busy city districts. Pasquinates, for example, functioned as a medium of communication intended to reach the urban public sphere, a tool to alert unnamed crowds and passers-by, especially those who were unable to read and could easily capture the language of what was being spread on the streets. And Pasquinates usually appeared around the port of Naples. So in a letter to the Venetian Senate dated the 6th of January, 1632, the Venetian ambassador uh, resident in Naples, Padavino, referred to a pasquinade a Nea written in Neapolitan um, and displayed in, uh, around the port soon after the eruption of Vesuvius. So in a time of dangerous collective vulnerability, political protest was to be expected. So reacting to the official interpretation of the volcanic eruption as a sign of God's wrath against human sins, the Pasquinade, um, entitled The Eruption of Mount Vesuvius, stated that the disaster had been caused by the viceroy's corruption and the injustices perpetrated by the government to Neapolitans. Unfortunately, the Venetian ambassador did not include the text of uh, that Pasquinade in his report. However, I strongly believed that he may have referred to this um, text, which is the text of a Pasquinade, and here read some passages in English. Traveller, if you see this epitaph, stop, read these verses and be angry. This young kingdom has been burned. Vesuvius is furious and Monterey is greedy. There is no difference between them. The former devours stones, the latter gold. The former pulls the mountain towards the sea, the latter our gold to Spain. The former dries up our wells, the latter makes us cry constantly. Cry, Naples, burdened by taxes, as you see your loaf of bread shrinking while I watch the oppressor devouring our taxes for his meal. End of quote. So end of translation. <laughs> Compared to the eulogistic tone used in printed text to describe the Viceroy, this pasquinade voiced anti-Spanish propaganda, thereby labeling the Viceroy as greedy oppressor who was held responsible for the unsustainable fiscal pressure imposed on Neapolitan people to subsidize Spanish interests and which would later on in 1647 led, uh, would lead uh, to, the, um, uh, to the revolt of Masaniello. So diplomatic dispatches often give a different account of public religious events attended by Spanish viceroy. So we see that in printed sources, he was um, described um, as a, a, almost as a savior of the city and an intercessor between the human and the divine dimension. So in a dispatch, in a, again, in another Venetian dispatch, um, a diplomatic dispatch sent from Naples, it was reported that during the procession, a procession led, to, uh, led by the Viceroy to appease divine anger, the statue of the Virgin, which um, was carried in the city center, uh, so as to uh, maximize uh, divine protection, um, unfortunately fell and broke. This was interpreted as an ill-fated sign, which also belittled the Viceroy's role in appeasing divine hunger. So a very a completely different description of his uh, role in, during the crisis. And consequently, and here a quote from the dispatch, uh, the Viceroy was forced to leave the angry crowd and took refuge in a church situated nearby." End of quote. Dissent also manifested through word of mouth. Diplomatic dispatches often reported on what was circulated and discussed in the city streets, for instance. A letter reported 
that, quote, broadsides containing astrological prognostications, end quote, circulated on the streets of Naples. Interpretations of the eruption as a son of God's wrath were paralleled by, quote, premonitions stating that the year 1632 would be marked by revolutions and radical changes of governments, end of quote. This proves that horoscopes and judicial astrology circulated beyond academic circle, circles and elitist groups. So frequent were astrological predictions that the authorities had to issue laws to tackle the circulation of material that would otherwise increase the incident of um, revolt. By contrast, in scientific literature on Vesuvius published in Naples, the discussion on the eclipse that dark the, darkened the skies in October 1631 followed a different line of interpretation. Astrologers analyzed the eclipse as being caused by the position of celestial bodies through a method that combined meteorolo meteorology and astrology. The transit of Mars through Leo, both dominated by fire, was deemed responsible for the eruption of Vesuvius. In analyzing the reasons for the salvation of Naples, they explained um, that the explosive gases caused by the volcano were channeled through the substratum of Naples towards the coast, and this would also explain the tidal wave. However, given stringent censorship, scientists analyzing the eruption as a natural event were forced to do so clandestinely. And um, there are some uh, um, manuscript academic speeches uh, delivered within an underground milieu that um, favor this interpretation of events and which unsurprisingly were never published. So their analysis nonetheless promoted a scientific approach to the study of natural disasters that initiated what would become a European debate on the subject that also sparked research on disciplines such as volcanology and earth sciences. And the examples I would like to show you very, very briefly um, um, this afternoon um, come from the Royal Society, uh, from the, uh, the philosophical transaction of the Royal Society, the academic, um, uh, the uh, uh, scientific academic that was, academy, sorry, that was found in London in the 1660s, uh, and which was one of the leading European centers for scientific research uh, from the late 6th, 17th century. So here we are slightly later in history, in the 1660s, and this is an account of what some people saw and brought with them back to England. So, and uh, here it's a, um, it, it's a, um, a uh, sort of a, um, a, a, an account of what some people experienced in the Mediterranean um, during the eruption, uh, and which was read uh, before the fellows of the uh, Royal Society. So, uh, this uh, document is uh, uh, entitled On the Raining Ashes in the Archipelago Upon the Eruption of Mount Vesuvius some years ago. This came but lately to hand from that knowing person, Mr. Harry Robinson, and was thought fit to be now inserted here, that is to say in the philosophical transaction, that it might not be lost, though it has happened above 30 years ago. It was contained in a letter um, subscribed by Captain Will uh, Budley in these words. The 6th of December 1631, being in the Gulf of Volo, riding a tanker about 10 of the clock that night, it began to rain sand or ashes and continued till two of the clock the next morning. It was about two inches thick on the deck so that we cast it overboard with showers as we did um, snow the day before the quantity of a bushel we brought home. So they brought home some ashes um, from uh, Vesuvius uh, and presented to several friends, especially to the masters of Trinity House. There was, um, there was in our company, Captain John Wilde, commander of the Dragon and Captain Anthony Watts, commander of the Elizabeth and Dorcas. There was no wind steering when these ashes fell. It did not fall only in one 
places where we were, but likewise in other parts, as ships were coming from St. John's uh, Acre to our port, they being at the time a hundred leagues from us. So, um, and here I just would like to show you where these um, people were. <laughs> so, um, so the um, Volos is in, in Greece, and as you can see from this map, uh, St. John's of Acre um, is in, um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East. Um, so this gives us an idea of how far the, uh, the territories that the ashes um, uh, reached and how far they, um, they uh, were able to, um, to, 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 to travel, if you like. We also have uh, quite a few accounts um, um, giving um, details about uh, the, the, um, the ashes that reached, for example, Istanbul, the Anatolian Peninsula, and it, this is, um, it, is evident from letters sent from various parts of uh, the Ottoman Empire, um, which give uh, detail um, about the ashes specifically. Um, so here, um, I'm going to conclude. <laughs> so as we've seen in um, a climate of uncertainty and instability, the copious literature on the 1631 eruption became a complex propaganda operation. Through state and church patronage, literature on Vesuvius provided a constructed narrative whilst promotive, uh, promoting a deceptive image of Naples as a city blessed with peace, devotion and social stability. Conversely, manuscript material offered a narrative that shows a city marked by an underground milieu provided a different interpretation of the eruption. We've seen that in some academies, um, the, uh, the, um, the interpretation of the eruption um, was of uh, a scientific nature, so it moved away from politics and uh, religion. From a political angle, the eruption raised dissent and was interpreted as a sign of imminent radical change and hence an opportunity to react against foreign dominance, fiscal oppression and stringent censorship. When assessed through the filter of science, the 1631 eruption of Vesuvius promoted an empirical approach that played a central role in sparking a European interest in volcanology and earth sciences, as we've seen for the Royal Society that promoted empiricism as a mode of uh, uh, scientific, um, and, uh, scientific uh, research. And we know that um, they uh, developed a strong interest throughout the 17th and the 18th century, strong interest in the Bay of Naples and in, in Vesuvius. Besides, the 1631 eruption of Vesuvius initiated an iconographical tradition that would lead to the European development of artistic genres concerned with Vesuvius. Um, and since the 1631 eruption, Vesuvius has always been uh, represented as billowing smoke. <laughs> uh, so it, the, the image of Vesuvius become, became um, Stylized, stylized, if you like. And uh, so uh, in images of Vesuvius, as we can see in this one, uh, continue to be uh, produced in paintings, engravings, and uh, but also in, 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 in various uh, ways within, well, the broad world, the, 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 um, um, the world of the visual arts. And here, I, I, this is my last image. I would like to show you an engraving of Vesuvius that was uh, produced in the 1690s by a female artist, a female engraver. Um, her name was Teresa de Po. She was born in Naples, but active in Rome. Um, and she came from a, a family of engravers and specialized. She specialized in uh, uh, scientific images of uh, um, Vesuvius uh, specifically. And this one, which is a marvelous, um, marvelous image, describes Vesuvius erupting in 1694. But uh, just to stress the importance of the 1631 event and the, the mark it left in 
history and uh, in, uh, uh, in, um, in, in memory, uh, we can see on, the, on top of this image, both on the left and the right, there are two images of uh, um, Vesuvius uh, back in 1631. So um, Vesuvius before the, uh, the eruption on the right hand side and erupting on the left hand side. And this image and other images were also sold on the market and uh, some of um, some of these uh, um, these sources features in the collections that um, are in um, are preserved and conserved in major uh, European uh, library library and institutes of research. So given how important the impact of this event, it is unsurprising that years after the eruption, texts on what became a mythicized event continued to be printed and sold um, throughout Europe. Thus, as late as uh, 1648, a Neapolitan diarist wrote in his private memoirs, and here I quote, accounts on the 1631 eruption of Vesuvius are impossible to find in Naples, even if one wants to price them as pieces of gold. This is because the habit curiosity of foreigners coming to our city empty our bookshops before going in large groups to climb Vesuvius. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lorenzo. That was such an amazing talk. Um, Thank it just you. occurred to me that even me nowadays, I always pictured Vesuvius with, with flames and fire. It never occurred to me that it can actually not be erupting. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We're now opening the floor for questions. Um, as Veronica mentioned earlier, you can either um, send your questions in the chat or raise your hand. Well, whilst people still think of some quite oh, Professor Luciana Villas Boas, please. Um, well, first, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, I would have um, many questions actually. It was such a inspiring, um, inspiring uh, description, historical reconstruction of the formation of a public sphere <laughs> at a certain moment. Um, so on the one hand, the medium of print establishes an event, a natural, natural catastrophe as a public event, as a common event in the social imaginary. On the other hand, there is this incredible diversity in inter interpreting this event and, and a competition, a, a, a kind of contentious um, debate on the meaning of this event. So um, I was wondering if you could perhaps expand a little bit on that, on this broader aspect of the formation of the public sphere and there is another, um, you, you, um, very um, en passant, you commented, I was really intrigued um, that something that might be a privileged instance to understand these different authorities and different narratives and a public, which is the relationship between patronage and censorship. Um, if you could expand just a little bit on that, would be wonderful. And and thank you so much. It was a lovely thank you. presentation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Professor. These are great questions. So the public sphere, yes, it uh, we see um, a very active public sphere uh -huh. at the time in, in Naples, and we have. Um, we have uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, public sphere opinions, ideas circulating uh, in, by looking at various sources. Um, obviously, printed sources sometimes give us a, um, a um, channeled 
uh, a channel description, channeled representation descriptions of what was circulating on the streets, what people thought, and how people reacted and responded responded to uh, the to uh, the crisis. But in manuscript material, we have um, a completely different world. Um, People were talking, people um, gathered in uh, public spaces, in, uh, in squares, in, uh, in, um, in, uh, um, around the port, which was a place of intense human mobility. Naples was also a multicultural city. It was home to various communities, slavery and Slavery was legally taxed in Naples and it would be so until the 19th century. So we also have the voice of uh, uh, slaves we, who were part of the community. So in this multicultural context, there, there were communities of Genoese, there was an English community, a, a Dutch community. News circulated, opinion circulated, people talked. And as we've seen in some manuscript materials, people reacted and said, oh, this is just the beginning of something much more serious that will happen. And this will give us the opportunity to react against the establishment, especially not, not, not the religious establishment, not the church, because the church was something that received a different type of criticism, but the state authorities and the public sphere is full, uh, the unofficial one, the one that we don't see in printed sources, is full of this uh, discontent um, to the extent that the authorities had to tackle the, uh, the distribution of uh, flyers containing astrological pre uh, premonitions and predictions, um, which in some cases I didn't have the time to, to discuss this, which in some cases saw the eruption as uh, um, the first phase of an imminent political change. And this is what was what, well, uh, not preoccupied, but um, threatened the authorities the most. Uh, the Pasquinade was uh, probably the, the most um, inclusive, social inclusive example of this. Although this Pasquinade was not produced by the people of Naples, the, the, lower, uh, the lower classes, as it were, uh, but was possibly, in my opinion, produced within academies <laughs> in uh, Neapolitan language so as to maximize communication, was uh, the, uh, I mean, described uh, in, very, in a very fluid and uh, um, easily capturable language, the discontent of people, which was mainly um, addressed against the, um, the Spanish authorities. So against the oppressor, against the fiscal oppression of, uh, of Spain, which was uh, taxing the kingdom to an unprecedented level to subside, subsidize the Spanish interests in Europe at the time because there were wars going on. But this tells us that the public sphere was full. Uh, the, 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 the main ideas discussed within the public sphere were of a political nature, a political nature. Um, with regards to uh, patronage and censorship, it was very strong. The two, the, the two went hand in hand, if you like, where one, uh, were the sides of the same coin. Um, the religious authorities and the state authorities were part of panels um, um, which would implement censorship in all its forms and as regards um, printing and the, 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 um, the production of uh, printed material, uh, there were those responsible. Uh, the patrons were also the censors and censorship was so stringent that uh, um, when a book was printed before being sold had to be rechecked so the, 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 uh, somebody wrote a book, they received the approval of the authorities, religious and state authorities. The book then would be printed, but before being sold, had to be rechecked by the same authorities again, which again were the censors and the patrons as well. So the relationship was very, very, very strong. And they patrons were censors too. <laughs> 
usually yeah. members of the clergy, of the high clergy, and um, and uh, officials working for uh, the the secular, the political authorities. I mentioned Favella during my paper. Favella wrote this uh, account, um, which obviously favors a narrative that is pro-Spanish, pro-Viceroy, and he was also. Um, named by the viceroy as uh, the um, uh, the gazette the um, the official writers of gazettes in naples so yes the, the patronage and the censorship were very um well went hand in hand <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Um, Veronica also has a question. I have many questions because, <laughs> as uh, Professor Luciana mentioned, um, it was really fantastic, and we keep thinking about all sorts of uh, examples throughout history of other disasters and cases. And I, I couldn't help comparing uh, the eruption to the fire in London in 1666. And I, I would like to ask you if you could, um, you know, discuss any of that, because especially because of the comparisons you made between Catholics and Protestants, because uh, in London, uh, the fire was seen as something caused by Catholics. And now we are talking <laughs> about a, a place that is Catholic. So uh, uh, I was thinking about this religious um, interpretations on the disaster and how uh, we can make those kinds of comparisons between two different confessions. Absolutely, absolutely. You mentioned, yes, the fire in London. Um, yes, um, the, um, y yes, the, uh, so sometimes um, disasters whether natural or man-made, um, were uh, interpreted through the lens of uh, religion. And what fascinates me is to see uh, that uh, we see, both within a Protestant and a Catholic context, we, th we see some similarities in the mindset of people, how people related, the, related themselves to, um, yes, the environment and uh, yeah, the, the, the um, origins of uh, disasters. Um, so, yes, these ideas of uh, God's wrath, of um, punishment, the punishment that uh, the, the disaster, whether it's, um, whether it's plague, it's a fire, or it's an earthquake or a, a volcanic eruption, is uh, the, the manifestation of God's wrath to, um, to punish uh, the uh, human behavior. It's very interesting and it's something that we see in, in, in both contexts. In, uh, there are other, also other disasters uh, that occurred in Italy uh, during the 17th century, apart from, for, uh, from other <laughs> eruptions of Mount Vesuvius, which was very active in the, uh, throughout the, cent the century, and other um, volcanoes in the Kingdom of Naples, because the Kingdom of Naples in that sense is it's unique. There are more than four volcanoes uh, and three active volcanoes. <laughs> so it's, um, but also, um, the kingdom was also um, a very, uh, was a, not just a, a volcanic land, but it was also uh, highly seismic. And, and therefore many um, earthquakes occurred throughout the centuries. And the reason to explain beyond the scientific um, context, to explain these events was linked to, uh, to, to God. Uh, was linked um, was expressed through this link between human behavior and God's reaction to it. Um, I think Nora also had her hand up. Hand up. Yes, I, I, I should just have put it in chat. Now that called to mind another and very powerful example, which is the one explored by David Underdown in Dorchester in the southwest of England, called Fire from Heaven. His book is because that inspired a complete um, 
revolution in the ruling authorities towards a very strict Puritanism and actually policing the morals of the town and setting up institutions for disciplining the poor and things like that. You, you, talk, you talked about the reaction on the radical side of, uh, you know, being part of a current of political dissent. But did the authorities react, this, the Viceroy and the Spanish behind him, react with, with a stricter regime in any way? Um, yes, they, uh, yes. Uh, what, what do you mean by strict regime in terms of uh, um, monitoring people's reaction to uh, response to the crisis? Well, it was, I mean, in Dorchester, it was, it was moralistic. It was, uh, it, it was um, suppressing sin, if you like. Yes. Um, and yes. and, the, the, and the, the, the reference to harlots and prostitutes and so on. Yes, um, yes, yes. We wonder how widely um, they were blamed not their clients, of course, but they would be blamed, uh, and, and whether there was any attempt to crack down on, on immoral activities like that. Uh, well, um, yes, that's a very, very interesting question. Thank you. Uh, both, both. On the one hand, these were acts of, um, with regards to prostitutes, which is the example you've mentioned, it is uh, int is an interesting one. And I think the prostitutes that decided to, uh, to um, to enact um, a self penitential um, to react uh, yes um, by uh, renouncing to they uh, to, by uh, regaining the morality that they had lost by being prostitutes was an individual uh, choice because in Naples uh, prostitution was legally taxed. It was a recognized profession. Prostitutes had to pay taxes, had, were allowed to live within certain areas of the city, and they had their own tribunal. So they were not, of course, prostitution was considered to be moral and etc. Cetera, et cetera, but there was a pragmatic dimension to prostitution that um, made um, this world accepted within the city even from a, a, a legal point of view. Yes, so, yeah. yes, when we see women, uh, former prostitutes marching uh, to, uh, as a form of repentance, if you like, it was mostly a, an, in, an individual choice. Right, uh, I see, yes. thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's com treated completely differently in a city like Naples. Yeah. But also uh, processions and um, acts, uh, religious, uh, public religious rituals, which were enacted and uh, became so important during the crisis, were also a way to, uh, to, um, to communicate, or well, to um, tell the people, the community, uh, that the crisis, the eruption had been caused by God's wrath against uh, <laughs> their sins. So there was this moralistic element that um, makes this case uh, similar to the one that you have mentioned. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, so that's interesting. Um, I also have a Professor Hussain, please. Uh, thanks, Loren. It's a great paper. Thank um, you. My camera's not coming on for some reason. Never mind. Uh, I wanted to touch more on on the part that you ended with when you talked about the Royal Historical, uh, the Royal Society, um, Kircher and stuff. To what extent do natural disasters, and this um, builds on earlier questions about public sphere, to what extent do natural disasters prompt a public sphere of scientific inquiry? and new forms of circulating knowledge and new advances, obviously in volcanology in this case, but obviously seismology, et cetera. I think in, we were discussing earlier in a natural disaster of the 17th century. Obviously, Veronica's pointed out the fire of London, but in terms of death toll, the only one I can think of is the great earthquake of Jamaica at the very end of the century, and in the 18th, obviously, the earthquake in Lisbon. So how... To what extent is there an interrelationship between natural disaster and a public sphere of scientific knowledge? 
Right. Um, public sphere of scientific knowledge. Scientific knowledge was still um, something that was discussed within an elitist context. Um, we know that in Naples at the time there were dozens of academies, some were uh, academic, um, some were uh, scientific academies, so there was a, um, a discourse, a debate on science that had developed prior to the uh, eruption of Vesuvius. Just to, just to, an example to mention was the Lincei Academy, uh, which was very active in Naples, although it was a Roman academy, but was a scientific academy that found in Naples very fertile ground. So there, there, were, uh, there was, um, research was very active, the, the, the scientific debate was very active, although within a, uh, I, I should say, within a scholarly, uh, scholarly context. So if we can apply uh, strain aspects of the public sphere within a, a more enclosed context, which is the context of the scientific debate within academies, then there was one in Naples. And we have um, manuscripts, manuscript lesson, lectures, speeches delivered in academies, which um, um, try to, uh, to, um, to explain the events to explain the eruptions, explain the earthquakes and anything that happens at that time through an empirical approach that moves away from religion, for example, and moves away from obviously politics, but from religious in particular. So within the sphere of academies and within the sphere of scholarship of academic circles and erudite circles, there was a strong debate. A strong scientific debate, which remained um, underground. As far as my knowledge goes, um, knowledge of the sources I've consulted goes, uh, I, um, I haven't encountered discussions within squares and the public spheres, in, uh, in broadly, uh, in broadly speaking, um, discusses scientific reactions, responses to the eruption. Even in the letter that um, the, the, the friar, the Cartusian friar sent to Peresk, um, the letter that gives the details of some, uh, of some uh, events that happened, in Naples, that happened in Naples, like the darkened of the skies, and so on and so forth. Everything is seen through a religious filter. So, um, Yes, it's uh, the, 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 the debate, the scientific debate is enclosed within certain spaces. I don't know whether I've answered your question. You have, thank you. Yeah, you're just making me think also about the particularities of Naples with the profusion of academies, whereas, for example, going back to Veronica's point and the Royal Society, that they did these intellectual circles are much more informal in the 1620s and 1630s and aren't formalized and institutionalized till later and play a quite different role because they're singular and have royal patronage, whereas, whereas there's a multiplicity. So it's, they seem to be functioning, the outputs seem to be similar, but they seem to be functioning a little bit differently. Yes, there, there is a, um, a very active underground milieu and we have instances of academicians that face the Inquisition during this period because they conduct research they shouldn't conduct, they um, come up with ideas that they shouldn't have been made, that shouldn't have circulated and here uh, the, 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 probably the most famous example is Giambattista della Porte, the scientific uh, research that he conducted, but this is prior to the eruption of Vesuvius, but within an academic milieu um, that was very active, yes, and um, had to, uh, and in fact, della Porte was brought three times before the Inquisition. And they said, if you want to survive, we, um, because this is the third time, he was a very powerful man. So through his context, perhaps he was, uh, he, he was spared from imprisonment. The, uh, the tribunal told him to devote his time to writing uh, plays and literature rather than being engaged in scientific, in dangerous scientific experimentation. <laughs> so. Um, does anyone else have any questions? 
Okay, so I'll finally make my own. <laughs> um, I was at some point you were talking about how this was in general a context of anxiety of all these millionaire expectations of how precisely how you mentioned before and how uh, after Lu Professor Lucia Professor Luciana's question about how um, this public sphere turned a natural. Um, accident into this whole apocalyptic thing and generated this entire apocalyptic perspective perspectives and I cannot help but think back to because uh, I studied the context of the the civil wars um in England so and they also we have so many reports on um comets and this general apocalyptic fear or that they were living the end of times and all that and 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 my supervisor professor braddock he he's currently trying to understand the context and characterize the context in terms of anxiety mm -hmm. so when you when you approached the matter of this was a, a context of anxiety i was just wondering how do you mobilize this idea oh, sorry this idea of anxiety in your research and how do you think it can be used for the early modern period. In what terms can we characterize a context as a context of anxiety? And how um, do you think that such contexts that are prone to this anxiety are somehow related to um, the rise of this public sphere? Do you think there's like a more or less direct connection be you know, between a context of fear and uncertainty and the rise of this these public discussions i i hope this made sense i'm sorry if it, it does it does uh, Lydia. thank you very much great question yes anxiety um manifested itself in different ways um anxiety um manifested through or was a, a direct consequence of uh, political discontent poverty uh, taxation um, and I think that public sphere within the rise of the public sphere this played a role because people talked ideas circulated people gathered and and therefore discussed what were <laughs> the, the problems uh, and what made people um, not uh, what what um, would cause people uh, discontent in all its forms. Um, in terms of uh, um, political anxiety, I think um, that natural disasters played a very important role. And uh, to see this m more clearly, we have to wait a few years after the eruption of Mangasubi, just to keep within uh, the, the, the topic that I've addressed tonight. Um, to the extent that when in 1647 the eruption of, oh sorry the uh, revolt of Mazaniello broke out in the city some considered the eruption of mind Vesuvius as not as a, a manifestation of God's wrath but as a, a sort of um, as the event the beginning of a disastrous of a chain of disastrous events that would lead to the revolt of Masaniello and to the end of misery, of the, the end of people's anxiety and people's sufferings by uh, finally um, freeing the city from the oppression of the Spaniards, uh, of the Spanish Empire. So um, this idea of, of anxiety, yes, from a political and economic perspective, uh, point of view was was very strong and we can see it this not described but uh, um, represented and uh, very much present in in the various texts both printed and, and, uh, and manuscripts in manuscript form because they, the, the large segments of uh, uh, Neapolitan society and we are talking about the largest city in Europe at this point were deeply unhappy with the establishment especially in the 1630s, where Spain needed large amount of money to sustain its uh, um, warfare and uh, um, international political choices, if you like. 
So anxiety, yes, manifested in that way. From a religious point of view, it's always anxiety related to this act of expiation of, uh, of um, yes, of, um, of purification from sins. Even though we've seen that um, people uh, were not entirely convinced about that because the Pasquinades and other manuscript sources tell us that people uh, were very angry against the political, uh, the political authorities. Um, so yes, um, anxiety, exp anxiety um, and expiation is an, an aspect of the Catholic world, the Catholic um, um, way of being, if you like, a way of living. But um, yes, in relation to these example case studies, I think anxieties, co collective anxieties were more caused by political and economic problems. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it makes it just strengthens the the idea and the perception to see that applied to different contexts and to think that in different cases. And Professor Hesayon mentioned that uh, anxiety also fits with the themes explored by Parker in Glo Global Crisis. Yes. As soon as as soon as Professor Lorenz started talking, Vero and Kanai commented, "Oh, it kind of resonates with with what Parker said because we just read." Um, that book a couple months ago, oh. well, lo lots of months ago now for a study group that we're both in. So yeah, it brings all that together quite It's a nicely. great book. It's a great book. <laughs> mm -hmm. The Global Crisis, absolutely, absolutely. Does anyone have any other questions or comments they would like to share? If I can just make a very quick question. Uh, um, I would like to ask you, uh, Lorenza, if there was anything, uh, also any almanac that was mentioning um, the eruption as well, because as you mentioned, the premonitions and all of those um, signs of the eruption or uh, in the other sense, the eruption as the sign of something that would happen that could be bigger. Uh, I, I was thinking about the almanacs and how uh, they could address this topic if if they did um almanacs yes um i haven't come across almanacs uh in my research almanacs um a feature later on i've seen almanacs um yes published in the 1650s 1660s in naples but not specifically during this this period no more astrological, yes, um, charts and um, yes, premonitions is a divination too. Uh, but almanacs, no, no. Unfortunately, I can't answer this question. <laughs> I just okay, haven't thank come you. across uh, <laughs> this type of material. Does anyone have any other questions or comments? Is there anything else you'd like to add, Professor? Myself? Well, it was a pleasure yeah. to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you to all of you and for the great questions too. Well, on that note then, uh, we would like to thank Professor Lorenza again for a fantastic talk. It was Thank you. splendid. Mm -hmm. Um, and we would also like to invite you all for our next meeting, which is going to be on the 9th of November. And we're going to have the pleasure to receive Professor Laurent Curely. Uh, and yeah, we look forward to seeing you all. It's going to be the, the one, we only have two more meetings this year. So it would be great to come with you. Uh, and yeah, thank you again, Professor Lorenz. It was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, so Thank you much. very much.